several states in our country doing this. Uh, it's a Bible reading, public Bible reading, at the courthouse Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock uh, here in Butler. If you'd like to be a part of that, you're welcome to come and be a part of that uh, Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock. If you'd like to read a section of Scripture, we've been assigned a certain section that we're going to read, five chapters, I believe, in 1 Samuel. Uh, and I'm the one who is uh, making sure, yeah, coordinate that, making sure everyone gets that. Brother Jeff, uh, at Reynolds Baptist and I are doing this, so uh, if you would like to read a section of scripture, uh, let me know. I'm going to put all that together uh, so that when we get there, it'll be organized, and I'll give everybody a card on what section they're reading so we'll know, and it'll go uh, flow in order. We're going to start reading at 8 o'clock on Wednesday morning at the courthouse, so I encourage you, if you can, to be part of that with us on Wednesday morning. Wednesday night Bible study at 7, of course. We invite you to be with us uh, there. I want to mention, too, again, Children's Church and Awanas. Uh, we need people to help us with those. There's still some a uh, few positions open for Awana ministry. If you'd like to help us, please sign up to do that. Our Children's Church on Sunday morning, uh, we need help. Uh, we only have three people signed up for Children's Church. If we don't get much more than that, we're not going to be able to start it back the first Sunday in August. Uh, so I encourage you, if you can help us, help us with that, please do so. Okay. 
Also, uh, Brother Gary is probably going to be talking to some of you about serving on the nominating team this year. We're going to have our first meeting in two weeks on July 25th. So I appreciate we need three people to help us with that this year. There's only two meetings that you have to go to uh, for that. Uh, and then, of course, you have to contact people who are serving in our church about the next church year. Uh, but I'll give you all the information about that if you've never served on it. You'd like to help us with that. Brother Gary is getting that organized. Already got it, you already got it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those who have volunteered. We appreciate it. We'll meet on July the 25th, uh, our first meeting. Also, we want to congratulate Zach and Leah on their marriage. Amen. <laughs> and our church family wants to do a shower for them on August the 7th at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's on a Saturday. Isn't that right? Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, August the 7th, the wedding shower for Zach and Leah. So please be a blessing to them. They're part of our church family. We're excited for them. So uh, you're welcome to that shower, ladies, for that. Okay? All right. Now let's look to the word of the Lord before we pray uh, this morning. Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with a heart. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. For he commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people who he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the public reading of your holy word this morning. We're grateful, God, that you are who you are. We've seen in this passage we read today, you have all power over heaven and earth, and you're sovereign in all that you do. and You control all things. Lord, our hope and trust is only in you, God. And we praise you and thank you that we can hope in you and we can trust in you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we praise you today as our Creator and our Maker and our Lord and our God. We thank you, God, for this time you blessed us. We have to come together and assemble in this place to worship you and to praise your holy, righteous name, to bow at this time of prayer and to pray to you, God, and to seek your face to humble ourselves before you, acknowledging you and recognizing you, O Lord. You are the one true and living God. And God, we praise your name. We're thankful, God, that you love us and you demonstrated your love to us and that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus came into this world and died on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for your death, your burial, and your glorious resurrection. Thank you for your exaltation into heaven. We're grateful today that you're seated at the right hand of the Father where you ever live to intercede on our behalf. We're thankful for the promise of your soon coming. Lord, as we continue to worship you this morning, we pray you'd help us to do so in spirit and in truth. Bless Danny as he leads us, anoint him with the spirit to do that. Bless our musicians as they play and help us as we sing that we lift our voices to you, that our minds and our attentions be on you today, that you prepare us to hear from the word of God. And I pray, Lord, when I stand in a little while to preach, Jesus, that you would help me to preach you in the power and demonstration of your spirit, that you would use me today to be able to expound upon the word accurately and correctly, Father, for your glory and for your honor. And I pray for everyone here that, God, you would help each one to be 
attentive to your word with understanding and a desire to walk in obedience to you. God, you know all of our hearts and minds and lives. We pray, God, that your will be done. We ask that you help those who are lost in their sins to turn to you in repentance and faith and be saved today. God, we pray for those on our prayer list. We lift them to you asking for healing and strength. God, we pray that you bless those who are hurting today. God, we ask that you lift up, continue to bless Brother James. Thank you, God, for how well he's doing from his heart surgery. We pray you continue to bless his health today and strengthen him, Lord, and all the others that we have on our prayer list. Be with those who are grieving, we pray, and give them comfort and peace that only you can give. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. A little less much.
off. So you just leave all that off if you want to. You just unplug it and leave it off. Take our Bibles and open to the book of John this morning. John chapter 1. John chapter number 1. While you turn that, I was reminded uh, when, we, when I got finished praying in that thunder first hit. <laughs> when I was about 8 or 9 years old, I can't remember, somewhere in that age, we went to Sunday evening service and they just started to sing it and Mama said, Son, go out to the house. She had forgotten something. And she wanted me to walk out to the house. They live right next to the church. And we'd run out there and get it. So I left and I ran out to the house and I got what she wanted. When I was coming back, you know, all the old country churches have the tables outside with the coverings over them where they had dinner on the ground. And so I saw Mr. Billy. His name was, he was a preacher. His name was Brother Billy. That's what we called him. He was kneeling down on the ground when I come up by there and I slowed down. I watched him and he was praying. He was pulling grass up by the ground. And all of a sudden, just a dark cloud came over the tree, and it started thundering. So I went to my church, and I went, I got by Mom, and I said, Mama, Brother Bill is out there, and he's praying up a storm. <laughs> <laughs> that reminded me of that. <laughs> well, I wish you could hear him preach. Woo, he could preach. John chapter 1. I want to read verses 1, 2, 3, 14, and 18 this morning as we continue our study on the triunity of God, the Trinity of God. So if you have your Bibles open, you're able to, please stand with me in honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word. We're here again from the Word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Now go down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now go to verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Please pray with me. Father, thank you for the reading of the scriptures again this morning. And as we come at this time, we're grateful for the opportunity this morning to be able, Lord, to look at the Word of God and to preach the scriptures today. We pray, God, that you'll bless this time, Lord, and you would just feed and nourish our hearts and our souls with the scriptures. God, we ask that you would help me to be able to preach this morning the power and demonstration of the Spirit. You'd speak through me into every heart and every life today. And may your will be done in each life today, we pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the second person of the Holy Trinity, and that you are God and our Lord, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Is everybody all right? Okay. God had, we started last week with the, this uh, attribute of God, the triunity or the trinity of God. I remember I, taught, I said the reason I call it the triunity is because it's three... God is three persons in complete and perfect harmony and unity together in the Trinity. God has revealed himself to us in the Holy Scriptures as the one true God who exists in three separate persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a monotheistic view. The Trinity is not three separate gods, but one God in perfect unity, harmony, nature, and essence. Although we cannot fully comprehend how this can be, we must believe it and we must teach it. Each person of the Trinity is real and distinct persons. They are not just one person who reveals himself in three different forms or modes. That's a heresy called modalism. The members of the Holy Trinity are perfectly equal. One is not greater or lesser than the other. Each member of the Holy Trinity may manifest themselves in different ways and carry out different functions. For example, no one has ever seen the Father. The Son became flesh and dwelled among men, and the Spirit dwells within each believer. So it shows us different functions of them. Although this is a complex doctrine, we should never try to explain it by comparison with things we do understand. God is incomparable. That was my last point last week, if you remember that. God, since God is incomparable, there's nothing we can compare Him to. And we saw different scriptures that tell us that in the Bible. 
He far exceeds our understanding. Today we're going to examine the, de the deity of Jesus Christ, which is the second person of the Trinity, the Son. The truth of the Father's deity is rarely disputed, but the deity of the Son and the Holy Spirit have been under constant attack throughout church history. Paul Washer writes this in his book, uh, Knowledge of the Living God, It is absolutely essential that every true follower of Christ learn from the Scriptures that both the Son and the Spirit are fully divine in the strictest sense of the term, end quote. So today we're going to examine the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. Here in John chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, is one of the most important texts in the Scriptures regarding the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning in this passage is a reference to the beginning of creation. As we saw last week in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, how God in the very first passage of the Scriptures in the Bible, He reveals Himself as a Trinity. The Father in verse 1, the Spirit in verse 2, and the Son in verse 3. Because He's called the Word of God here, and He speaks everything into existence. With just reading this verse here in John chapter 1, verse 1, we can see the emphasis on the Word who is God and was with God before creation. Word is translated from the Greek word logos, something, which means something said, including the thought, by implication, a topic, subject of discourse, also reasoning with the mental faculty. By extension, a computation, specifically with the article in John, the divine expression or Christ. So here in this, in this passage, we see the word logos. This is the divine expression of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This word logos held great significance at John's day when he wrote this with the Greeks and the Jews. Both the Greeks and the Jews knew this word and understood this word, and this word held great significance with both societies. This is why I believe the Holy Spirit used this word as he gives this to John to write this. In Greek philosophy, logos is referred to as an impersonal force or reason that gave unity and order to the universe. John MacArthur writes, it was in some sense a creative force and also the source of wisdom. The average Greek may not have fully understood all the nuances of meaning with which the philosophers invested the term logos, yet even to laymen the term would have signified one of the most important principles in the universe, end quote. So you see the significance that the word logos held even to the Greeks, and so when they would hear this as John is describing how God became man, how Jesus Christ was God in human flesh, it held great significance to the Greeks as they heard the word logos. John represents Jesus as the personification and embodiment of logos, the divine expression of God in human form. To the Jews, John presents Jesus as the incarnation of the divine power and revelation of the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord held great significance to the Jews from the Old Testament teachings. And so when he uses this word logos, the word of God being the word of the Lord, uh, it shows that God in the incarnation became man in the form of Jesus Christ. John MacArthur writes, As the incarnate word, Jesus Christ is God's final word to mankind. And, and we see in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, and his last day spoke unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the writer of the book of Hebrews, he's writing this to Jewish Christians. In the very beginning of the book, he wants them to understand that the Logos, the Word of God, as John describes here, is none other than Jesus Christ, and he's the last word that was given by the Lord to man. God doesn't give new revelation anymore. We have the Scriptures, that's the revelation he gives us, but Jesus is the incarnate God in human flesh. The word logos is none other than Jesus Christ. Look at John, uh, verse 14 again. It tells us that. And the word, that's referring back to verse 1, the same word, became flesh. That means became human and dwelt among us. 
John says, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it's very obvious that when he starts off this chapter in this book, he uses that word logos, the divine expression, God becoming man, and he tells us that in verse 14. They're the same ones. So this has got to be Jesus. He says in, in verse 1, go back to verse 1, he says, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Three times the word was is used. This Greek word is the imperfect tense of the verb, emi. It was, describes continuing action in the past. A continued, not a starting action in the past, but a continuing action in the past. It indicates that the Word, Jesus, was continually in existence before the beginning of creation. This proves there was never a point when Jesus Christ came into being or existence, but he has always existed. Amen. If that were true, if, if Jesus had an, a beginning, if there was a point of existence for Jesus, John would have used the Greek word genome, meaning became. The word became instead of the word was. Next, John says the word was with God, taking his argument of the deity of Christ a step further. Our English translation of the original Greek expression does not bring out the full richness of this meaning. In the Greek, it is prostontheon. Prostontheon, the word was God, means far more than merely that the word existed with God. It gives the picture of two personal beings being face to face with one another in intimate fellowship and relationship together. That's what it expresses to us. This proves that the word logos is a person, not an attribute of God, and is the same essence as the Father when we see it in this way. They were face to face together. John then goes a step further in the argument of the deity of Christ. John MacArthur writes this, The word was God. That's what he says next. The word was God in John chapter 1 verse 1. In the Greek it is theos in ho logos. That's how it's written in Greek, which you could literally translate that. Theos, God, in, was, know, thee, and Lagos, word. So you would say God was the word. Instead of, the word. instead of saying the word was God, you would say God was the word. It's perhaps the clearest and most direct declaration of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ found anywhere in the scripture, John MacArthur writes, end quote. The description of the correct grammar is important in a complete understanding of this text. For some have argued that this actually means the word was a God or had some attributes of God, not that he was God. For instance, Jehovah's Witnesses in their so-called Bible, their translation, that's what it says in John chapter 1, verse 1, in their translation, and the word was a God, little g, because they don't believe Jesus is equal with the Father. But that is a misinterpretation. That is a wrong translation of this Greek text that I'm showing you here. Theos in ho logos, God was the word, very clearly tells us, that the word was God, not a God. John MacArthur writes this, Heretical groups, almost from the moment John penned these words, have twisted their meanings to support their false doctrines concerning the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Noting, y'all, I'm hot. I take this off. Is that, can I take this off? I don't have the mic on. It ain't working anyway, right? No, I'm good. I'll be soaking wet by the time I get done if I don't take that off. <laughs> Let me get back to John MacArthur in writing about how this Greek is written here in this passage. He says, heretical groups, almost from the moment John penned these words, have twisted their meanings to support their false doctrines concerning the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, noting that theos, God, is anarthrosis, not preceded by a definite article. Miss Ellen could probably help me a lot better with this, being English uh, teaching on grammar. So it's not preceded by a definite article. So some argue that it, it is an indefinite noun and mistranslate the phrase. The word was divine. Merely possessing some of the qualities of God are even more appalling. The word was a God, end quote. Well, I've looked this up in a grammar, in a Greek grammar book, a manual for Greek grammar, and it says this about this passage. The absence of the article before theos, which is God, however, does not make it indefinite. Lagos, for word, has the definite article to show that it is the subject of the sentence, since it is in the same case as theos. Thus, the rendering, God was the word, is invalid because the word, not God, is the subject. 
It would also be theologically incorrect because it would equate the Father, God whom the Word was, with in the preceding clause, with the Word, thus denying that the two are separate persons. The predicate nominative, God, describes the nature of the Word, showing that He is of the same essence as the Father. So the way it is written in the Greek, it gives us the support that God and the Word are distinct and separate beings, but they are of the same essence and nature. Y'all what are y'all with me? I'm not a good English teacher, so I had to read all this stuff. <laughs> John MacArthur again writes, according to the rules of Greek grammar, when the predicate nominative, God in this clause, precedes the verb, it cannot be considered indefinite, and thus translated a God instead of of God, merely because it does not have the article, end quote. Paul Washer writes, in John chapter 1, verse 6, verse 12, verse 13, and verse 18, the Greek word theos, for God, is used without a definite article, and yet clearly refers to God. This meaning excuse me, of a term is always determined by its context. To say that the Son is a, a God contradicts all the other scriptures that declare that there is no other God of any kind, end quote. Which is true. When we look at these other verses, Theos is there without a definite article, so it shows us that that is God, so it must be the same in verse 1 as well. Leon Morris in his commentary writes, How else, how else other than Theos in whole Lagos in Greek would one say the word was God? There's no other way to do it but by that way. If one does not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ and his full equality with the Father, they cannot be saved. Amen? So Jehovah Witnesses are lost because they're taught this false teaching about Jesus Christ. <clears throat> John then repeats the truth of Jesus being face to face with God before creation. Look at verse 2 of John 1. He was in the beginning with God. <clears throat> Again, that verb is used in the Greek, was there, showing that face-to-face -to -face, uh, together before creation. He then relates to his creative power, the Logos creative power, in verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Those pronouns him are referring to the word Logos in verse number 1, uh, and what he is referring to in verse number 2. And so we can see in contextually it flows together uh, that it is talking about the Word who done the creating process there. And verse 14 clearly tells us it is the Word who became flesh or became man. So this is Jesus Christ. Verse 18, look down at verse 18. <clears throat> no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. God the Father dwells in unapproachable light. 1 Timothy 6.16 tells us that. It says, Who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So Paul writing Timothy, he says, No man has seen the Father. He dwells in unapproachable light. All the visions of God in the Old Testament were very limited revelations. They were not full revelations of the Father. They were very limited revelations. For example, Moses, when he was on the mountain with God, and he asked God to show him his glory. This is what God said in Exodus 33, verses 20 through 23. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me. You shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So even Moses could not look upon the face of the Father because no man can see him and live, God the Father says. Verse 18 tells us though, that it tells us the same thing. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Begotten in this passage is translated from the Greek word monogenes, denoting uniqueness or one of a kind in nature. In, in nature. It doesn't mean that Jesus was born of the Father, like you have children and I, we have children. No, it means that Jesus is one of a kind, the one and only Son of God. Only begotten Son can be translated in this passage as only begotten God. Instead of only begotten Son, this literally is only begotten God. Matter of fact, if you use an English Standard Version, an ESV, or a New American Standard, that's what your Bible says. Anybody got one of those? You got one, Ashley? Read that verse. Read verse 18, Ashley. And enter, you got the English Standard Version, right? Yes. All right, listen to how he reads it. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made known. 
he has made him known. See, the, right there, it takes out that begotten. He says the only God instead of the only Son. The New American Standard says this way. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. And so that doesn't mean that Jesus was born, but this it clearly tells us that he is God in this verse. Jesus is God who became human, so he's the image of God in human flesh, as John tells us in verse 14. The Apostle Paul also teaches this truth about Jesus. Listen to this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 17. He, referring to Christ, is the image of the invisible God. See that? Once again, Paul says the Father is invisible. No man can see him. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So not only does Paul clearly teach us there that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, that when they saw Jesus, they were seeing God in human flesh. Amen. Amen? Not only that, but he's also the creator of everything. He also says that in that passage. John writes again in verse 18 that, only begotten Son, or God, who is in the bosom of the Father. Bosom of the Father is even more is even a more beautiful description of the truth revealed in chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the bosom of the Father. The Son always dwells in the most perfect fellowship of intimacy and love with the Father and the Spirit. They all three dwell together in that way. He says that he declared him in verse 18. Jesus declares the Father. Only God can fully comprehend God. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. We can't fully comprehend God. Only God can fully comprehend God. Can I tell you, angels can't even fully comprehend him. Only God can fully comprehend God. So to be able to fully declare him, God had to do that. Because no, one's able, uh, no one else is able to declare, fully declare God. And so for it to say that he has declared him or declared the Father, he must be God to be able to do that. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. This is Jesus speaking. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So it is Jesus who reveals God to us. This is why Jesus said when they see him, they see the Father. Listen to this in John 14, beginning at verse 7. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know me and have seen him. I mean, I'm sorry, it is kind of hard to see. And now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So Philip said, show us the Father. He says, how long have you been with me, Philip? You have seen the Father because you see me, is what Jesus is saying. Paul, in writing to the church at Colossae, reveals the deity of Christ by stating the fullness of God dwelling in him. Colossians 1.19, For it pleased the Father that in him, in Christ, all the fullness should dwell. And in chapter 2, verse 9 of Colossians, Paul writes, For in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Christ it was in Jesus when he came into this world. Now let me tell you something. There's no human being able to hold the fullness of the ocean in their hands. And there's no one that was able to hold the fullness of God either, except for God himself. And so Jesus Christ and the, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Christ, he had to be God for that to happen. He couldn't just be a form of a God or just have some of the attributes of a God. He had to be God himself. Amen. For the fullness of God to dwell in him bodily, he had to be God. One of the greatest testimonies given in Scripture of the deity of Christ 
is given by Thomas, the disciple Thomas. Remember, he's doubting after the resurrection of Jesus. The disciples see Jesus. Thomas is not with them. So he tells Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He says, unless I see him myself and put my hands in his hand, the nail prints in his hands and his side, I'm not going to believe. And then the next time Jesus appears, Thomas is with them and he sees them. And listen to this in John 20, 24 through 28. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the prints of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, the disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Yep. He's testifying that Jesus is God. Right there. Amen. Amen. He uses the Greek words kurios, Lord, and theos, God. Guess what? That's the same Greek word that John uses when he says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was Theos, God, the same word. And Thomas is de declaring, testifying, you not only are you Lord, but you are God. Amen. 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 Thomas declares both for Christ. If Thomas was mistaken due to a misdirected zeal, if, if Jesus was not really God, Jesus would have corrected Thomas. But he doesn't correct Thomas because Thomas is right in his declaration. Amen. Even the Father. I want you to see this. You've probably seen, if you read the Bible, you've already read this. But even the Father himself declares Jesus is God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Listen to this. But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And so in verse 8 of Hebrews 1, it, he's quoting Psalms 45, 6, and 7 here. So it's not Psalms 45, 6, and 7. But in that first verse, in verse 8, in Hebrews 1, God is speaking, the Father. And he says, your throne, O God, is forever. He's talking to the Son. And he declares he's God. And then the writer in verse 9 is saying that therefore God talking to uh, this Jesus, your God, the Father, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. So twice there we see that Jesus is declared as God. Quoted from Psalms 45 in the Old Testament. And I, saw, I shared this verse last week in my message about the Trinity, that there is no other gods beside Him, right? In the Old Testament, we see that God is called the first and the last, God the Father, Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. The New Testament gives the same titles to Jesus Christ that God gave to Himself in Isaiah. Revelation chapter 1, beginning at verse 10, says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then in verse 17, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, John says. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Well, how do you know that's God the Son and not God the Father speaking, Fitz? The next verse, verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Who is that? Jesus. He's the one who lived and died on the cross and he resurrected, right? God the Father didn't do that. That was God the Son did that. And so Jesus declares that he is the first and the last. And then at the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation 22, 12 through 13, and behold, Jesus says, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first... And the last, the exact same title, God the Father gives himself in Isaiah, Jesus uses for himself in Revelation. By the way, if you're ever witnessing to a Jehovah Witnesses, I encourage you to use those verses. Because they don't believe Jesus, God the Father and Jesus are equal. And Jesus is God. And so when you show them that, 
that the same title God the Father gives to himself, Jesus gives to himself as well. And there's no doubt in Revelation that's Jesus speaking because he's the one that died. He's the one that came and died and rose again. Amen? And he's the one that's coming quickly in Revelation 22 as well. If Jesus was not God and he was not equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, he would never have used those titles for himself because he would not blaspheme. Amen? Amen. It is unmistakable, y'all, in the Holy Scriptures that Jesus Christ is God. I've just shown you just a few places this morning, but this, to me, in the New Testament in John 1, really just lays it out for us and shows us that Jesus Christ is God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Are you trusting in Him? He is the Redeemer. Amen. He is the Savior. Hey, remember last week we looked in the Scriptures in Isaiah and God said, there is no other Savior but me. That was the Father speaking. And now we come to the New Testament. Who is the Savior? The Son, Jesus Christ. They're equal. Amen? you got to have your faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone to be saved today. Jesus is God. Next week, we're going to study the Holy Spirit and His deity, that He is also God, and He is equal with the Father and the Son. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time we've had together this morning. We praise you, Jesus, that you are God, the creator of all things and the maker of all things, and we praise your name. We thank you that you're our Savior and our Redeemer and our Lord. And as Thomas said, we declare as well, you are Lord and God. We praise you. Have your way in every heart and every life this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Page 488, if you want to look at the book. Thank you.